Motherboards and motherboards, over to you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for that lovely, warm introduction. And can you all hear me at the back? Great. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming to hear about the archaeology of the New World in a building where Schliemann told of the treasures of Troy in Mycenae. Usually when I give a lecture on this subject, I begin by asking the ages of those present. I won't ask the same of this audience, but only ask you to bear in mind that such a detail helps me to get across to those more used to prehistoric tools and analog technology, the unique nature of computer archaeology. It's a field which is both modern and prehistorical. The record is ambiguous, contingent on take-up and familiarity, travelling between innovation and obsolescence in a cycle based not on change over millennia, nor centuries, nor even now decades, but years and months. The track from product to discard is not one clean trajectory, a time's arrow, but an array of potential and personal paths determined by relative value. The point I make to the students schooled in what we might call traditional archaeology is that the usual processes linking artefact to activity are overturned by this unpredictable technological engagement. And that is determined by other factors, from accessibility to knowledge to geography, and the means to make the technology work. In a world where fast internet can be more easily obtainable in a developing country in South America, as in a village in the Welsh borders, the uptake of the artefacts, the material of the digital age, makes a strata of meaning complex to understand and unreliable to record. Dialogues attaching memory to artefacts, the grandmother's uh, recall of an object in a museum, here has evolved into parents remembering buying and using their first computer. And even more, given the accelerating change over time, siblings exchanging a plaintive, oh, I remember when, as they recall an earlier MacBook. For the past decade, I've given an annual lecture to Bristol students with a typical age range of 20 to 23. Over the years, the response has changed as the tech world has turned around them. I now hear gasps of recognition at mention of earlier models of machines which they now recognize as not technology used and discarded by my generation of baby boomers, but their own personal narratives. After years of lecturing about what they see simply as old stuff, I'm suddenly preaching to born digital students, and they can see that the gadgets of earlier technology they have rattling around in drawers are ancient in, in contemporary terms. They are the artifacts of the digital epoch. I'll return to that class of 2016 later, but first I should lay out my fieldwork and site of primary excavation. So this is the sort of material I'm dealing with. <laughs> um, we have here uh, a very old model, but also what, what is so interesting about this is these are part of the, the collector's realm as well. The way that um, we look at old technology through new eyes, and uh, you see in the, um, in the computer museums, photographs and advertisements are, are, are collected and coveted. And this looks rather dull, but actually, when you look at an array like that, the, the interesting thing, the most important thing, is this computer comes with a manual. And you'll see it's not a glossy, beautiful manual, but something that's almost like a, you know, printed um, on a, a photocopier. <laughs> and this is a real thing. <laughs> and, and again, what's fascinating is the way that... Um, modern uh, technology is now looking at old technology and, and finding uh, accents of something which is quite comforting in the old designs. I looked up uh, you know, Maplin's um, technology, I was looking for a, 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 a radio, and I called up the radio products they had around at this time of year, and nearly all of them were retro. They were the sorts of things you would have seen in the 1950s and 60s or 70s um, on tables, and they all come back in fashion. So, Silicon Valley. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept of, of how far it stretches, but what we know today is Silicon Valley is part of the Bay Area of Northern California, extending 70 miles down the peninsula south of San Francisco. It has no map coordinates as such, being a loose accumulation of cities and areas which extend out from San Jose, a city known as the capital of Silicon Valley. I think you can all see that in the centre there. 
I say accumulation as during the first dot-com boom in the late 1990s, Silicon Valley was a name check of success, a place with which to be identified, to flock to. Workers travelled in from as far south as Gilroy, the garlic capital of America, and went to Livermore West with its major defence lab. The path to the southwest is halted by the Santa Cruz Mountains and the surfing beaches reached by exhilarating but slow highways. Palo Alto has Stanford University, and from this intellectual node, it is an easy reach to Mountain View, Santa Clara, Menlo Park, and Cupertino, key cities in the story of computing. But between them, the lesser known Saratoga, Sunnyvale, Campbelltown, and Woodside, where the fruits of stock options can be seen in the homes and businesses. In the hills over Woodside live the pioneers of the pre-dot-com boom, those who made their money in the earliest tech epoch. When it came, the technology industry was founded on convergence, as it was in the first wave on America's east coast. There, IBM and Digital Equipment Corporation, better known as DEC, had similar innovation. The common factor was esteemed universities, Stanford and UC Berkeley on the west, and MIT, Harvard, Yale, NYU, Princeton, down Route 128 on the east coast. Plus a significant driving factor, not pure commerce in the early days, but defence innovation. But why Silicon Valley in the west and not Route 128 in the east? The geographer Annelie Saxanian established the difference in a prescient 1996 book, Regional Advantage. She fleshed out the causal factor. It is one which traditional archaeologists can identify with in the establishment of urban centres, the weather. On the West Coast, this gave a significant social advantage. The great outdoors community reveled in sports and informal activities, which provided a fertile ground for sharing and pro proliferation of ideas. And open-air lab compared with the cubicles of the East, hunkered against the seasons. In California, after all, the Bohemians existed on both co coasts and extended their easy living ethos as the 1960s hippie movement on the West. Even as those on the East were clustering indoors, just as intensive, but engendering a less sharing <coughs> philosophy. But it hasn't always been tech. Within our memory, what is known today as Silicon Valley was the Valley of Heart's Delight, an extensive fruit growing area where apples were simply apples. And the smell of blossom in spring was a constant on the breeze. The orchards are long gone, but their memory remains in the place names there. Prune Yard and Blossom Hill Road. The manufacture lines were not of product, but produce. Into this balmy climate poured migrant workers from all over America. The image here is of prune packers, but by the end of the 20th century, the production line was packing technology and bringing with the workers their own cultural identities. San Jose has Japantown. The Hispanic and Vietnamese communities were so large in the late 1990s to warrant their own language version of the Silicon Valley newspaper. And this is a, a couple who were working in salad production and then switched to, um, to games and uh, then became very much part of the Silicon Valley boom with, uh, with checking um, computer parts. And when I photographed them in Palo Alto back in 2000, I thought, my gosh, I, you know, what that tree has seen, if only it would talk. <laughs> and those who came to pack technology also unpicked it. Along with the assembly line came the dissemblers, who protected the commercial interests of Silicon Valley's innovators by stripping old technology, dead tech, at specialist recycling companies. The baskets of precious metals and reformulated metals uh, materials at last resemble something we might recognize from the archaeological hoard. The value of one over another in a tech table of precious inclusions reminds of Herodotus describing the allure not of gold but of silver. And there is a further classical analogy that these tech recyclers, the requirement to destroy motherboards, literally deliver them to fragments rather than let a rival company pounce reminds of the deliberate destruction of weapons in the Iron Age, the action rendering them powerless while appeasing a deity. So crucial to the growth of the technology sector in its early years on the West Coast was the working together 
a lot of scientists in closeted labs, as I mentioned, but hobbyists building computers and finding a need to share knowledge and those hard to acquire resources. The car park of Stanford's Linear Accelerator Center became a regional powerhouse in the unlikely swap meet of those who were happy now to be called nerds and geeks. The Homebrew Computer Club, of whom Steve Wozniak here on the right um, found a member of Apple, was a member, um, took its aesthetic from the whole Earth catalogue and other craft identities, opening their car boots, or pro more properly trunks, to swap. Steve Wozniak was one of them, trading or simply exchanging not just the physical bits and pieces of early technology, the motherboards, the components, but the stuff which drove the valley into the 80s, ideas. In this fertile but sharing, crucially sharing, environment, companies grew from the defense industry technology, spurred by the idea that one day the computer would be personal and made at home. Steve Wozniak who is actually a, a great um, computer historian enthusiast. At a store called Weird Stuff, an extension of that idea, I photographed this ramshackle floor in 2000 using a disposable camera and mapped it like a fine sight. This is the type of place in which the weird stuff is discard, then desirable in a matter of years. But other factors give relevance to how weird it actually is. This is trash treasure and uh, trash and treasure in a single context. And tech companies also branch like a family tree or biblical begetting. The defense child, uh, giant Fairchild, for example, beget the silicon chip manufacturer Intel. In the first week of the 21st century, I visited Intel's in-house museum in Santa Clara. The company had initiated an awareness of its own history by inviting employees to denote, denote donate, sorry, something from their work, rooting around in the carefully classified drawers, which look very much like a, a typical museum we might think of in another context. I found something with a written account and so traced it back to its employee, George Chu, who had started at Intel. Chu worked in packaging, not the cardboard kind, but the core dynamic in silicon chip manufacturer, that echoing Intel founder George um, Gordon Moore, sorry, is ethos of smaller, faster, cheaper. Chu worked to shrink the package of components. The power of this unremarkable looking artifact lies deep inside it. How would we determine that archeologically? You can just see there on the right hand side. So it's clear the interpretation relies not simply on historical account, but personal recollection and media. Even before the sudden deceleration of the dot-com crash in the spring of 2000, Silicon Valley's paper of record, the San Jose Mercury News, was sounding a warning which, viewed today, was prophetic. Your phone is wireless, your office is virtual, and your social life is non-existent. And after the crash, a month ago, you were a 28-year-old millionaire, now you're just 28. <laughs> when the dot-com crash happened, the old-timers, those who made their fortunes in the defense industry days, were not surprised that it had happened, so much as the speed of its decline as venture capitalists, heady from handing out funding to com companies with only spin for product, retreated, leaving the startups to vanish into the same hot air from which they'd appeared. The material culture mapped this change the for sale columns of the Mercury News and how quaint selling something in, through print advertising sounds these days, were filled with Porsches and high, other, other high-end signifiers. Those renting were offered a premium to find new tenants and housing prices plummeted. Those houses which have provided for me an example of the Pompeii effect, what would we surmise from excavating a 10 bedroomed house unknowing that it had a single occupant who had cashed in his stock options and become a millionaire. So this now reverted to a more traditional pattern of occupation, affordable to a different category of worker or family, again complicating the cultural mix. And what complicates this further is of course now since um, Web 2.0 uh, of the last few years, it's become even more expensive to live in Silicon Valley. And uh, I read quite recently about uh, people uh, tech workers earning high salaries having to live in trailer parks who have their Teslas parked beside them. So in those days, though, going back to uh, this era of uh, just after the dot-com crash, so 2000 and, um, 
well, mid-year of 2000. So workers without work left the tech industry and gravitated back to their home states, or simply back home in with their parents. The car parks emptied, businesses shuttered, and the lost or orchards had a currency at last. Nostalgia and hankering for the past, history's time had come, and I could get a proper handle on the archaeology. So by a great good fortune, my fieldwork straddled this dot-com divide, the end of the boom time and the start of the crash. I'd become acquainted with a trio of coders or programmers through a chance meeting on a flight to San Jose. Through them, I began to understand how the material culture, the artifacts of this early digital age, meshed with the human story. Of this trio, Tom Jakovitz on the right here, had three companies by the age of 26. His friend Adam, in the middle, was a problem solver for a new company called eBay and gained me access to look at its modest server, the lodestone for its computations, housed in a cage with an armed guard. Another programmer, also Tom, here on the left, had crossed from Florida to be part of the tech story. They took me out in the early days of 2000 to see how coders lived. It was anthropological, anthropological as archaeological. The predominantly male workforce took their laptops to nightclubs, evidencing the uneasy mix of work and leisure in the pressurised cubicles of late, 19, uh, late 1990s Silicon Valley and the early days of 2000, when there was no time for rest, let alone play. Social observation was one thing, but I needed to rest my case on what might be the artefacts of a future archaeology, the material culture. The mantelpiece in Tom's apartment gave me an array through which I could articulate this. The random collection is an accumulation over a short time and speaks a language of the dot-com era. Brands and signifiers, markers of exclusion and hierarchy, presented with humour and forgivable swagger. I listed the objects as I would an archaeological assemblage. The Pez dispensers signal one means uh, the, the coders kept going on these uh, high sugary, uh, sugary um, uh, energy products. So the drinks, sweets, and other performance in enabling intoxicants were part of the, the mix that you would see on the mantelpiece. The writer Douglas Coupland, in his novel about the early tech wave, described the popularity of certain flat foods which could be slid under the door of a programmer locked in the dark for days. The novelties which, uh, with company names signalled attendance at one of the prestigious parties or launches which were a signal of performance. The inclusion here of a penguin is an immediate marker for Linux, the open source program favoured by most coders at that time, being in West Coast style uh, unshackled to corporates. The early promotion for Apple signalled it, signalled it as different from IBM, the suits versus the t-shirts and jeans the closed singing versus creative freedom, and Linux was a symbol further out the box. Aside from the artefacts given out by companies, the Pez dispensers and other novelties were acquired by coders from a marketplace which fused the regular shoppers for electrical wares with the coders who were innovating such goods. Fry's, a store, had a novel, steam, uh, novel theme for each store, and I would see their clusters of geeks cross-legged on the floor, poring over an array of computer components, amid the casual shoppers spending their inflated tech salaries on technology, which, by being in production, and not least on sale, was already out of date. My reason for being in Silicon Valley in the first place, aside from being bumped off a flight to Oakland and having to opt for a place I only knew from a song title, was curiosity. The conversation with Tom, as I mentioned earlier, seated next to me on the plane, began with my comment about his PDA, the personal digital assistant, um, the old name for a smart gadget. That's cute. How long's that been out, I asked him. It comes out tomorrow, he said. I designed the email for it. And so began my story and my, my journey to Silicon Valley as I thought, where is the place for the past in this thrusting valley with its dynamic, as Michael Lewis observed, of the new, new thing? The answer was there was not much, or rather a lot of history, but not much place for it. This is the ins inside of Fry's. I'm sorry, I should have showed this one earlier. Um, the Fry's in, in one of the areas has a, an Egyptian thing, and you would find, and still can find, um, technology on sale in, in mock-up um, artifacts. So. 
Um, and this is a cistern. There was actually um, a Rosicrucian museum, not far up from that Fry's, um, where they have uh, like genuine archaeology uh, uh, artifacts, including um, uh, pieces from Egypt and Rome. And I found that the cistern was quite an interesting one to, to see there because of the chaos that was evident in uh, post-boom uh, Silicon Valley and people trying to recalibrate. Um, and this was uh, the cover of um, the first sale I ever went to of old technology uh, was held on April the 1st, and it wasn't an April Fool's joke, um, on the East Coast. And it was um, of uh, computer artifacts of the 1940s, um, including a piece of the ENIAC, which was a, a defense, piece of defense system. But what was remarkable about this sale was that it started with um, the old sort of gadgets and uh, automata that we think of as, as sort of 1940s, uh, sorry, a, a Victorian um, and earlier technology. And then it progressed right through, so it became a sort of microcosm of the history of archaeology through this particular sale. And this is a rather beautiful um, poster, which was sold as part of it. So this is the, the ENIAC, and um, the, the piece that was actually uh, on sale was rather like the, the object being held by its two inventors. So uh, when I went to this sale, I was convinced that there was enough of an argument to talk about the archaeology of Silicon Valley. And I had the West Coast material, and now I needed to show what survived out east. So as I said earlier, the, the poster was one of the lots, and the rest of the artifacts seemed homespun folk art, or more familiar old technology of automata, lantern slides, and slide rules. And the venue was uh, an auction house in the country, and as the lots were sold and the bidders fell away, I was left in a cluster of people interested in what was the start of a rather different set of values, inspired by what was happening on the West Coast. So the prize lots towards the end of the sale were artifacts from the attic of a technologist called Presper Eckert. His widow had come across them after his death, in the attic, in a typical way, and asked a local auctioneer if they had any value. He decided to list them. They included the scientist slide rule, of interest given the provenance. But another lot was a remarkable piece of computer history. Presper Eckert, pictured on the right, with his co-designer, John Morchley, developed a piece of wartime technology called the ENIAC. And the bidding for one of uh, a number of these panels used in the machine rose steadily upwards. The eventual price, and I think I have it, yeah, that's how it was listed and, and viewed. The eventual price was far in expectation of the estimate, and when I approached the bidder, I was not surprised to be told that he was acting on behalf of the buyer who wished to remain anonymous. Several emails and months later, I did meet the buyer, himself a part of computer history, a technologist by the name of Nathan Meivold, who, with Bill Gates and Paul Allen, had founded Microsoft. I was invited to see his personal museum in Seattle, and there found another type of computer excavator. My world had, a, had the means to buy extensively on eBay and scout for artifacts, not acquiring for resale value, but because of an obvious connection with the artifact in its functional state. He also funded the rebuilding of Babbage's engine in the Science Museum in London, which some of you might have seen. And it's, um, there was another one in the Computer History Museum in, uh, in California, and it's now, I believe, gone back to Meibold's house. He has, um, uh, as we might paraphrase from what the V&A used to be with the uh, cafe with a museum attached, he has a house, um, or museum with a house attached in Seattle. So the relationship between history and living memory continued to evolve back in Silicon Valley. Hewlett Packard, um, oh sorry, this is the, one of the slide rules, uh, press bracket slide rule. Hewlett Packard bought the garage in which their company started life, and Apple donated much of their archive to Stanford. The history of technology as a discipline now extended to the computers with which students and faculty were familiar, as well as the products of the Industrial Revolution and the pioneers heading west. In the UK, a talk I gave at a computer and history um, heritage conference in the spring of 2000, with some trepidation to other archaeologists, I made the case for computers as heritage and began to suggest a new midden to mine for the emerging field of contemporary archaeology. Even junked computers, floppy disks, I argued, could be rescued from the spoil heap and used to evidence quick change over time. Then, in the manner of a local giving field walkers a tip about marbles be, uh, being used to short, store sheep feed, as I came across once in Italy, I was given the email of my everyman. 
Salam Ismail, pictured here, had more than 3,000 different models of computer, together with manuals, peripherals, advertisements, and games. He'd founded the Vintage Computer Festival to celebrate the history of technology, a place where speakers would be insiders who had not only used um, the older machines, but designed them. Exhibitors came from all over America and further to show their working models of, of resurrected technology, and the, the crucial thing here is they're working. The audience grew from die-hard geeks and nerds to a new generation who embraced the relevance of seeing the old machines at work. Within a decade, retro tech became a trend, but earlier the computer collectors began to be recognised as hobbyists with a valuable skill, excavating lost data. Salam was even asked to help a group of Florida archaeologists who could not um, access reports from a shipwreck of, of Florida. These were 1970s uh, excavations. Another woman uh, came to him because she wanted to retrieve her late father's novel that was trapped inside a computer. Lawyers came to him needing evidence for prior patent suits. And the prescience of expert hobbyists, many of whom, like Salam, have no university degrees, but a passion was increasingly apparent. The tech industry started to pay attention to them and their favoring of the old, old, and their painstaking attention to gathering not just the well-known machines, such as the iconic Apple I, but the ordinary models long forgotten, one which everyday Americans, um, on which everyday Americans and British people had turned out schoolwork, accounts, letters. The collector's ethics code insisted that data found on machines was deleted to the point where it was no longer identifiable. This is some of the, the types of machine he would cross the country to collect. Um, we all have these stories, or many of us, I should say, have these stories of computers as big as a room. And uh, these are the sorts of things that are now, when they're put on show at the Vintage Computer Festivals, they're running. And the smell of them actually brings up a wonderful sense of memory, a sort of reverie. So the Computer History Museum, um, that's a, the, uh, the prized uh, Apple One, which uh, now fetch hundreds of thousands of pounds, and I actually collect the computer collectors. I go off and interview um, Apple One collectors. And this was something which uh, those of you who work in tech know what you're looking at. <laughs> um, this came from Oxford. Uh, when I went, went back there, I was um, a research associate at the Institute of Archaeology where I did my undergraduate degree and my doctorate. And I um, asked them if they had any, any technology that they, could, um, they felt was old. And they, this was, again, back in 2000. And they had a cardboard box with some stuff in it. And I just went through it and found this um, very excited um, email. Um, or early email. Um, I think those of you who are working in academic technology know about the process of all of this and Janet and things like that. But here it's first foreign user hooray and it's 1988 which sounds to me terribly recent <laughs> but it's obviously not in computer terms. And I'm still trying to find out a bit more about this story and trying to track down all the characters that um, were part of, uh, of sending and receiving this. So the Computer History Museum now in Silicon Valley is, is a major player. Um, there's a, an interesting story to do with the dot-com boom because uh, it was on course when I first encountered it, when it was a series of porter cabins. It was on course to, to build a multi-million dollar purpose-built museum. And um, they had to ditch that plan when the philanthropy fell away and instead inherited an artifact. So Silicon Graphics, which might be a name some of you know, SGI, um, in the uh, in the you know the boom time, it's doing incredibly well, and then in the crash, it it started like many companies to have to downsize, and so its old headquarters in Mountain View, um, where the archaeological trace includes SGI on some of the chairs, is now the home for the Computer History Museum, and it's really well worth a look. Um, and it, it also hosts the Vintage Computer Festival West, where I was speaking uh, a few months ago. And so this time you get the Born Digitals coming and gawping at the relics of the old days, of the green screens, and listening to the rhythm of dot matrix printers. So nostalgia is still a driving force in this celebration, but now the archaeological component is more understandable in the experience, not just an awareness of the fragility and temporary nature of data, but its durability when put to the test. Salam and his colleagues can take years to unlock material, with their extensive gathering, not for monetary value, but to make each machine make sense, 
includes the manuals to unlock the code. So I remember when Salam came over to Oxford um, in, I think it was about 2001, 2002, he was so excited to go to the Oxfam store um, in Oxford because it had a whole load of old computer um, manuals that nobody wanted. And he fell on them because this was new stuff for him. And not only that, it was transatlantic. So that was also part of his collection. So comparing this to the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone sounds a long stretch. But as we lurch towards the Internet of Things, those artifacts of the next generation of archaeologists, the ability to read lost data becomes even more relevant. We're aware of excavations which have yielded boxes of material without context, where the archaeologist has died without writing up. And there's a sense of the past being robbed. There's a similar unease, I think, about the amount of data rendered digital, which, without the key to unlock it, will be immortalised only as far as the available knowledge to resurrect it. Retro tech introduces the notion of nostalgia, the respect for discarded and defunct technologies, which goes beyond the traditional confines of collecting. There's a vogue for retro computing, as I said earlier, as a means of accessing cool artefacts, particularly those from the 1970s. These have an appeal quite different to those expressed by people who grew up with the technologies, who used and discarded them as out of date. The culture of collecting computer material is dynamic, both as a field of study and dissemination. It's contingent on the experience of the viewer. This might be argued for a traditional field survey. Someone used to picking out worked flint from stone chip by tractor will have a higher hit rate because of knowledge accrued over time and experience. But here we're not dealing with the relative slow speed of prehistoric artifacts. Computer technology artifacts instead demonstrate an exponential rate of change over time, which means a tech museum would have to put box computers straight from launch into storage, then bring them out as soon as they've gone through the cycle from cutting edge production to mass consumer, to obsolete, to discard, to collection. So this is the sort of stuff, again, that, that you can find at weird stuff, but also in hobbyist collections, um, where they take something and they wrap it up immediately. It's a bit like people buying, I suppose, Apple new Apple materials um, or Apple uh, gadgets and not unpacking them, just leaving them simply as they are. So the importance of Silicon Valley's heritage is marked in other ways, too. There's a place called Was Way. Um, in Silicon Valley, which references jobs Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, as I mentioned earlier. And elsewhere, the names of other innovators, such as Hewlett and Packard, live on in the buildings to their name. It's also a ritual space. When Steve Jobs died in 2011, shrines were made outside the company's Cupertino headquarters and at Apple stores worldwide. In this way, heritage is literally mapped onto the spaces of Silicon Valley, despite its non-existence as a formalized entity. Therefore, beyond civic and commercial references to an archaeological-informed past, Silicon Valley hosts other, more traditional forms of heritage that seek to construct an archaeology of computing for the area. The Computer History Museum evokes a mixture of curiosity and nostalgia, enhanced by narrative storytelling and traditionally curated artifacts. Exhibits. This is evidenced by the procedure devised for the collection posted on the website. The Computer History Museum is continually growing its collections of computing history materials. In particular, we seek items that engage our various audiences and can be used for interpretation, discussion, or research. While it has an extensive wish list of collectibles, the museum's curators must be selective, saying, collecting must be deliberate and sustainable. Thus, new artifacts are accepted into the collection after careful consideration by a team of curators. So in the very early days, people would just leave boxes of stuff on their doorstep. You imagine what might come out of um, attics in Silicon Valley. And through it, they did get some amazing stuff, which are particularly things that hadn't yet um, gone into production or had missed the curve. So the, um, the museum in 2011 was officially relaunched with the completion of its revolution exhibit, charting the de development of computer history and actually recognising the role of the hobbyists and visitor numbers suggest a growing interest, which I would argue comes not simply from the objects becoming more valuable per se, but because the valley of the now has grown appreciative of its history, especially since the dot-com crash. While there's perhaps no need to state what computer history stands for in Silicon Valley, 
Even the new generation of Web 2.0 workers either remembers the golden days of the dot-com boom as a tech worker, or grew up with the crash, or is part of the booming social networking economy. The passing of Steve Jobs prompted global discussion about the Apple legacy and suggested a greater understanding of how material culture impacts on the present and potentially offers lessons for the future. It will come as little surprise that the artifacts of retro technology are now being collected just as the treasures of the classical world bypassed museums and decorated homes. Computer collectors who save for historical reasons have been battling on eBay against those acquiring for investment. In 2002, Salam Ismail auctioned an Apple I as a unique event in the nascent Vintage Computer Festival. It fetched $14,000. In 2012, I interviewed an Italian Apple enthusiast who paid more than £200,000 for a similar model. He intends to keep it on display. And luckily for the genuine technology collectors, the items still represent a more risky investment by dint of being too familiar and untested. And without an aesthetic allure, it seems there is more interest in Madonnas for them than motherboards. But back to those Bristol students. Conversant with a generation of archaeologists which digs up memory sticks and bags up data cards as small finds. While I've argued for the case for retro technology as a window into the future, I'm now curious to see how the born digital generation values its own personal technology past. After age, the second question I ask comes from my own experience of writing my doctoral thesis on a second-hand, second-hand Apple LC3 bought from a previous doctoral student who had written her own uh, thesis on it. She expressed to me that she was sad to see it go. She would possibly be surprised, maybe touched, that I still have that computer, redundant to me after 20 years. And so it contains somewhere in its workings both our theses on a redundant machine I cannot yet discard. So the question I ask the students is, has anyone kept items of technology that they no longer used or is now redundant, but they cannot, for some reason, throw away. And my latest students earlier this year did not disappoint. Every single one had their own old tech collection, but did not know it. Laptops, iPads, iPhones, iPods, unplayable computer games, cables, usurped BlackBerry phones on which they started to be smart. In attics, cupboards and drawers, gasp of recognition at modern artefacts which switched on a type of digital shared memory. So who can laugh now at the computer collectors who determinately stored what they could in their cars, as I saw them, and in their homes in the Hollywood Hills? Like those who followed Schliemann and prized not the gold, but the prehistoric artefacts. For the geeks and the nerds and the archaeologists tracing the rich and unexpected material legacy of our now common technology, They've got more than their day in the sun. Their time has finally come. Thank you.